Chapter 10, Harvest Time The only reason I was hopeful about returning to school was that my father had managed to harvest a small plot of tobacco. He had saved the seeds from the previous year, and back in September I had nursed the seedlings down at the Dombo for transferring them to our fields. Somehow the plants had survived much of the famine and grown fairly healthy, the leaves light brown in color with traces of red. Several weeks earlier, Jeffrey and I had picked the tobacco and hung it to dry under the bamboo shelters. In a normal year, a crop that strong would fetch a high price at the auction in Lo Longwe. But now, with the hunger, we couldn't be sure of anything. Besides, my father had already started borrowing money and mice in exchange for the tobacco once it was ready, which meant that the minute those leaves were dry, we'd have to start setting our, settling our debts. As the first day of school approached, I was getting indications that things were okay. For one, my father had said nothing to me about staying home due to lack of fees. In fact, one afternoon, he even handed me a few kwacha to go buy a notebook and pencil. And my mother had purchased a big bar of maluwa soap, which allowed me to finally scrub the yellow stains from my school shirt. The night before the big day, I carefully ironed my clothes and laid them on a chair right next to my school supplies, so they were ready for the morning. I was so nervous that I stayed awake for hours trying to imagine every detail, what I would eat for breakfast, what I'd look like in my uniform, and how I'd greet Gilbert on the road. I desperately missed my friends and the excitement of a classroom. When Gilbert appeared from the trees the next morning, I ran to meet him. Gilbert, Bo! Bo, sharp, sharp, fit, fit. Welcome back, friend. It's good to walk with you again. Oh, thank you, Gilbert. It's good to be here. It was great to be back with my pals, all of the jokesters and usual entertainers. I saw many familiar faces. We were all so thin, and that wouldn't change until the harvest but at least our health was improving. But just as I'd feared, I was behind in everything. Geography, agriculture, math, all the subjects I'd studied in the library. My fellow students were working on graphs and variables and scientific names of animals. I didn't know any of that stuff. I struggled for the first two weeks, copying all the notes I could, while trying to get the hang of classes once again. It had been a long time, and so much had happened. After ten days, the deadline for paying school fees was approaching, and I started giving, getting nervous. Something didn't seem right. My father knew the fees were due, but he hadn't mentioned anything. And, fearing the worst, I couldn't bear to bring it up. The closest we got was a short conversation one afternoon in the fields. So, how is school life, he asked. It's going okay, but I'm so behind. I think with time I'll catch up. Well, he said, just work hard. Despite him saying that, I couldn't help the sick feeling in my stomach. It was still there in the morning. Mr. Fury gathered everyone for morning assembly. Fees for this term are due Monday, he said, and those students who didn't pay last term's fees must also pay those without delay. Hey, wait a minute, I thought. Even though I dropped last term, I still had to pay those fees? It didn't seem fair. Together, the two terms equaled over 2,000 kwacha. Given what my family had just been through, 2,000 kwacha was an impossible amount. I knew my fate was sealed. But instead of going home to face it directly, I tried going to school for free. I snuck in. I had to calculate my movements carefully. On Mondays and Fridays, Mr. Fury held assembly inside the same classroom. There, he read aloud all the names of students who had already paid their fees, telling them, Go class straight away. The students who were still seated had to show a receipt or else stand up and leave. Jeffrey had been humiliated this way two years before, so I was ready. On the first day of roll call, I arrived at school with Gilbert as usual. But as soon as everyone stay, went inside for assembly, I checked into the toilets to hide, ducked into the toilets to hide. I stayed low and scanned the courtyard through the tiny window. The minute Mr. Fury released everyone, I slipped into the crowd unnoticed. In class, I sat in the back of the room and kept my head down. I never asked questions for fear of being noticed. As long as I was silent, though, I could listen and still learn. I was certain Mr. Tembo, who was wise to my tricks, remembering that I was booted the previous term for lack of fees, but if he knew, he never called me out. The whole experience was so stressful that each morning I awoke with the same awful stomach ache. Gilbert would meet me on the road and try to make me feel better. Good morning, friend. I'm happy to see you're trying your luck again. Yeah, I said. Let's hope today isn't the end. Just stay quiet and don't say anything. I guess. Finally, after two weeks, I was busted. One morning, Mr. Tumble read aloud the names of debtors in class, and that's when I was caught. The second my name was called, I stood up and walked to the door. Guys, I paid, I said, trying to be cool. I just forgot my receipt. I'll get it and come right back. Once outside, I began to cry. 
Then I went home and told my father the news. I've been expecting this, he said. I just didn't know when. But instead of breaking my heart, my father went to see Mr. Tembo and pleaded on my behalf. The tobacco would be ready in a few weeks, and after paying his creditors, my father was hoping against hope there'd be enough left to sell and cover my school. I'll have the money soon, he said. Just please let him stay. Mr. Tembo spoke to some other teachers. They agreed to let me stay in school for three more weeks, long enough for my father to sell the tobacco. And those three weeks were fantastic, like winning the jackpot. No more sneaking around, no more butterflies in my stomach. Now I could relax, learn, and participate in class. And when the teacher cracked a joke, I laughed at the top of my voice. Oh, that's so funny. Or, good point, I didn't know that. The other students gave me strange looks. These past weeks, he's been posing as the cool, quiet guy, one said. But look at him now. At the end of three weeks, the tobacco was finally dried and ready, having turned a light chocolate brown in the sun. Once this happened, the creditors began turning up at our house, looking to be paid. I've come for my 50 kilos, one said. Given our earlier agreement, do you have my 20 kilos? asked another. By the time the last trader left, pushing a bicycle laden with our tobacco, all that remained was a 60-kilogram bushel. My father loaded it into a pickup and drove it to the auction holdings limited in Le Longue, where the buyers only agreed to take 50. After transport costs and government taxes, my father came home with around 2,000 kwacha. It was just enough to pay for my school, but then there'd be nothing left for the rest of the family. No money for my sister's shoes, no cooking oil, soap, or medicine if someone got sick. Once again, we were broke. My father tried negotiating with Mr. Temple, but Mr. Fury forbade me to return. He said that his boss, the Minister of Education, was visiting various schools to ensure that students were paying their fees. If we're caught, we could lose our jobs, said Mr. Temple. I was sitting in the courtyard when my father returned with the news. I've done my best, he said, but the famine took everything. He kneeled down to face me. Please understand me, son. Papani qui nim Biri, I'm very sorry. Your father tried. It was too difficult to look at him. Chop we know, I said. I understand. At least with daughters, a Malawian father can hope they'll marry a husband who can provide a home and food and help them continue their schooling. But with a boy, it was different. My education meant everything to my father. That night, he told my mother he'd failed his only son. Today, I let down my entire family, he said. I couldn't blame my father for the famine or our troubles. But for the next week, I still couldn't face him. Whenever I did, I saw the rest of my life. My greatest fear was coming true. I would end up just like him, another poor Malawian father, farmer, digging the soil, thin and dirty with hands as rough as timber and feet that knew no shoes. My life would be forever controlled by rain and the price of fertilizer and seeds, never by me. I would grow mines, and if I was lucky, maybe a little tobacco. In years when the crops were good, and there was a little extra to sell, perhaps I could buy a new set of clothes. But most of the time, there would be hardly enough to eat. My future had been chosen, and thinking about it scared me so badly, I wanted to be sick. But what could I do? Nothing. Only accept. I had no time to feel sorry for myself. The mice was finally ready in the fields, and my father needed all of our help. As much as I had waited for this time to come, I entered the harvest with a conflicted heart. Now that I knew I wasn't going to school, the mice rows appeared like the bars of my own prison. I would enter their shadows, and the gates would lock me be lock behind me. But at the same time, my God, we were finally harvesting our food, and really the harvest was the most fun time of the year, even better than Christmas. It was a time to celebrate all of your hard work. All the mornings you woke up at 4 a.m. to dig ridges and pull weeds, but this season it was even more significant, a time to remember the famine, the many nights of hunger, and the good people across Malawi who didn't starve or didn't survive. Mostly, I thought about Kamba and the sadness I carried inside. And now, as we entered the Mize Rose, ready to work, it was as if God is rewarding us for our sacrifice. We had a beautiful crop. The best in years, my father said. Just look at it. My mother stood beside him, staring across the fields with a smile I hadn't seen in months. We made it after all, she said. For the next two weeks, we harvested all day with satisfied minds, and at night we slept like lions with bellies full of food. After collecting the cobs and hauling them home by ox cart, we spent three glorious weeks just sitting in the courtyard plucking what we'd grown. We listened to the radio, sang songs, talked about the weather. Life had returned to normal. In storage, our grain sacks were full once again. So many, they reached the ceiling and spilled out the doorway. Some soybeans from the garden were also ready, which meant we could enjoy regular meals. 
slowly all the weight we'd lost during the famine started coming back. Ah, Papa, my mother said to my father one night, you were looking so skinny. My father smiled, and you, Mama, I see you're finally coming back to us. But William, eh, I was worried that a strong wind would carry that boy away. We all laughed about it now because it was only during good times that we could talk truthfully about the bad. Once harvest was over, I was able to return to the scrapyard to collect pieces for my windmill. Walking through the tall grass, I'd see something interesting, pick it up, and think, what on earth is this? Only to spot something even better a second later. One day, while poking through the weeds, I found what looked like a four-wheel drive differential, the gears that send power to the wheels and allow the vehicle to turn. I managed to pry off the, the casing with my screwdriver and discovered gobs of black engine grease. Every machine needs grease, I thought. I scooped it out into a plastic bag and stuck it in my pocket. That same day, I found a handful of cotter pins left inside a discarded hubcap. I collected bits of wire, plus some things I'd probably never use. Bra brake pedals, a broken gear stick, and the crankshaft from a small engine. I took them home anyway. Early on, I realized that one of my biggest, most important pieces, a bicycle, had been sitting under my roof from the start. My father's bro broken bike had been leaning against the wall of the living room for over a year, collecting dust and dirty laundry. It had no handlebars, only one wheel, and its frame was rusted as anything in the scrapyard. I'd offered to repair it many times, but my father always gave me the same answer. There's just no money. One day, I finally gathered the courage to ask him if I could use it for my windmill. I sat him down and explained the entire process, how the bike frame would make the perfect body and be sturdy enough to handle strong winds. I described how the wind and blades would act as pedals to spin, and the wheel and power, spin the wheel and power the generator. Electricity, I said, spreading my arms like a magician. Water. My father just shook his head. Son, please don't break my bike. I've already lost so many radios. Besides, one day we'll use that thing. Use it for what, I thought. To ride five miles? To buy kerosene for the lanterns that make us all sick when you could have lights for free? Oh, it took so long to convince my father to give up that piece of junk. I must have begged for an hour. I have a plan, I persisted. Allow me to try. Just think. We could have lights. We could pump water and have an extra harvest. We'll never go hungry again. He considered this a while, then finally gave in. Okay, perhaps you're right, but please don't mess it up. I grabbed the bicycle and hurried into my room where I leaned it against the wall of my other materials. Standing back, I realized how my room had come to resemble the scrapyard itself. All of my windmill pieces, the bicycle, tractor fan, shock absorber, and bearings, sat in a picture-perfect row, like in a museum. The rest of the floor, however, was covered with random greasy bits that spilled under the bed and piled behind the door. The room smelled like the inside of a transmission. You never know what you might need, I reasoned. Of course, I forbade my sisters from even entering my room to sweep and mop. I was certain they didn't appreciate the value of a used muffler clamp or water pump. Who knows what they might sweep into the dustbin. But Mama told us to clean, they yelled through the door. I'll tell you when it's time, I answered. I'm busy. When I wasn't in the scrapyard, I hung out at the library or sat in my hammock and read. At this point, my father felt so bad about my schooling that he no longer forced me to work in the fields. This made my sisters jealous. Why does William get to stay home and not us? Doris asked my father one day. Is it because he's a boy and we're girls? If he's staying home, so are we. William has a project, my father said. And if he's really wasting time, he'll be proven wrong eventually. You girls just worry about yourselves. With my father's blessing, I spent mornings and afternoons planning my windmill. I pored over chapters about electricity and explaining physics. I learned how it moves and behaves and how it can be harnessed. I reviewed sections on home wiring, parallel circuits versus series circuits, and more stuff on AC and DC currents. Back at the library, I renewed the same three books over and over until one day, Miss Sicolo raised her eyebrow. William, are you still preparing for exams? What are you up to? Just building something, I said. You'll see. More and more, going to the scrapyard began to replace school in my mind. It was an environment where I learned something new each day. I'd see strange and foreign materials and try to imagine their use. One thing looked like an old compressor, or perhaps it was a landmine. I found real compressors and shook them to hear the pieces rattling inside, then I would pry them open and investigate. My imagination was constantly at work. Sometimes I pretended to be a great mechanic, crawling on my back under the rusted cars with the tall grass clutching me in its arms. I'd shout up to the customer, Start it up. Let's see how she sounds. Give it gas. Don't be shy. Whoa, 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 that's too much. If the engine didn't sound right, I'd give it to them straight. Looks like you need an overhaul. I know, I know, it's expensive, but that's life. I shouted to my other mechanics who were slacking as usual. Fury, today you're doing oil changes. 
Yes, boss. Another mechanic walked over, shaking his head. Problems again. Mr. Kumquamba, boss, we can't fix this car. We've tried everything, but it still makes a noise. What do you think? Start it up. Hmm, yes. Hmm, injector pump. Thank you, sir. For sure. I climbed atop the tractors, pressed the ignition button with my foot, and pretended to drive. Out of my way, your man from Kwamba must work. In my mind, I dug ridges in my fields, making up for all the days I'd swung a hole in the sun. Each time, I wished one of those tractors would actually fire up and move. If it did, I dragged the whole scrapyard home. But no matter how much fun I had, my moods didn't last long. The students across the street at Kachikolo could see me banging away on various things. If I wasn't careful, they could even hear me talking to myself. A few times while carrying out my pieces, some kids in the playground cried, Hey, look, it's William, digging in the garbage again. The first time it happened, I walked over and tried to explain the windmill, but the kids just laughed. Even days when I tried sneaking past, someone would spot me through the open window and shout, There goes the crazy guy, off to smoke his chamba. Chamba is marijuana. Luckily, I did have a few supporters, but Jeffrey had been hired by her uncle, Maswalwali, to work at the mice mill in Ch Chimpumba. That meant that Gilbert was the only person I could trust. Finally, I decided that whenever someone shouted, William, what are you doing in the garbage? I'd just smile and say nothing. Of course, the students at Kachikolo told their parents about the lunatic in the scrapyard, and soon my mother was getting an earful in the trading center. Now, when I came home with my pieces, she stared at me and shook her head. One day, she barged into my room, looking worried. What's wrong with you? She said. Your friends don't behave this way. I mean, look at this room. It looks like a madman's room. Only madmen collect garbage. That night, she complained to my father. How is he ever going to find a wife like this? How is he going to care for a family? Leave the boy alone, my father said. Let's see what he has up his sleeve. Over the next few weeks, the treasures kept revealing themselves like pieces of a magic puzzle. When I realized I needed more PVC, Gilbert allowed me to dig up the drain pipe from the floor of his bathhouse. He didn't bother asking his father, who wasn't happy the next morning. Once the pipe was cleaned and dry, I cut it down the middle with my bow saw. I melted it over the fire until it bubbled and curled, then rolled it off and pounded it flat. I then cut four blades, each measuring four feet in length. I wanted to go ahead and connect the blades to my tractor fan, but I had no nuts and bolts. I spent the next two weeks in the scrapyard turning over every machine and piece of metal, but I only had a box and wrench, and it was too large for most of the bolts I found. Many were so rusted they stripped against the tool and refused to budge. I told this pathetic story to Gilbert one afternoon, and right away he offered to help. His father sometimes gave him money for working in their fields. That day, Gilbert walked to Mr. Dowd's shop with 50 quatcha and bought a sack full of screws, bolts, and nuts all the perfect size for my windmill. I was so grateful. But I still had a problem. The metal pieces needed to be welded together to ensure they would hold. We had no welding machine at home, and to hire a welder cost more money. I was stalled again. Then one day in the trading center, I got lucky. I was playing bawa with some friends when a man pulled up in a dump truck. He was from Kasungu and needed boys to help load some wood. I'll pay 200 kwacha for the job, he said. I ran over waving my arms. I'll do it, I'll do it. He motioned me into the truck bed, along with ten other guys. I spent all afternoon throwing logs under the sun, tired, sweaty, and with the biggest grin on my face. With 200 kwacha, I could pay a welder for the first phase of work, connecting the shock absorber shaft to the bicycle's bottom bracket. That way, it could spin the crankshaft and chain and move the wheel. I also needed him to melt holes in the metal blades of the tractor fan so I could bolt the bigger PVC blades. Mr. Godson's shop was in the trading center, under a grass-covered shelter. He used an electric welding box, ancient looking, and made from wood that plugged into the wall of his home with a long patched together cord. A crowd of people usually gathered around to watch him weld, myself included. The men would discuss the particular project while the boys played in the shower of the sparks that shot from his gun. Even though I had money for the job, Godston laughed when I walked up carrying my pieces. You want me to weld a broken shock absorber to a bicycle with one wheel? He asked, mocking me. Others in the crowd joined in. Ah, look, the madman has come with this garbage. We've been hearing about you. Eh, hey, he's not a man, just a lazy boy who plays with toys and refuses to work. He's Masala. That means crazy. My face grew hot. I was so tired of hearing those words. That's right, I said. I'm lazy, Masala, whatever you want to call me. But I have a plan and I know what I'm doing, so all of, soon all of you will see. I then turned to Godston and gave him the dead eye. And to answer your question, mister, I said, you heard me right. Weld the shock absorber to the bicycle and make sure it's not crooked. When Godston was finished, I paid him my money and took the bicycle home. I returned it to its place in my room and started laughing. It really did look like a madman's creation. The shock absorber jutted from the crank set like a strange robotic arm. Its joints fused and melted into melted metal. 
Next to it, my blades leaned against the wall like giant insect wings. Their white surfaces scorched and bubbled like a burned marshmallow. The tractor fan looked like a super Chinese throwing star, one that would slice through the darkness, leaving a trail of light. I couldn't wait to put them all together. But once again, I was missing something, and it was a big something. I needed a generator. But where in the world was I going to find such an expensive thing? I could wait and try to earn 500 kwacha to buy the dynamo in Dodd's shop, but that could take forever. The owner of the dry goods store had hired a permanent team of workers to unload his trucks and jobs. Loading wood came only so often. So I went back to the scrapyard. I spent the next three weeks sifting through the grass like a bomb-sniffing dog, turning over every piece of metal in hopes of uncovering a generator. I may have missed, or at least an alternator. Hadn't I seen several of those? Well, it turned out that I wasn't the only one looking for such things. Some younger boys from the trading center had also discovered the importance of electric motors. But instead of using them for science... They were just stripping out the wire to build toy trucks. I caught them one day as I entered the yard. I shouted, hey you, but they took off running. Maybe they'd heard stories about the madman and feared for their lives. Anyway, when I got to where they'd been standing, I found a perfectly good motor stripped of its wires. It lay there dead in the grass like one of those poached elephants missing its tusks. I began to fear my windmill would never get built. Worse, over the next month, it seemed like every dynamo in central Malawi came out to taunt me. I saw them on bicycles everywhere. And most of the time, they were broken, not even attached to a bulb. I'd think, God, what a waste. Give it to me, and I'll show you how to use it. Others worked perfectly and shot fat beams of light down the dark roads at night. I never had the courage to flag down the owners, but what would I say? Instead, I woke up each morning to the pile of metal in my room and then went to help my father in the fields. At night, the windmill pieces were easier to look at, since everything disappeared in the dark. One Friday in July, Gilbert and I were walking home from the trading center, and I was feeling glum. How's the windmill going? he asked. I have everything, but still no generator, I said. If I had that, I could build it tomorrow. I'm afraid this dream will never come true. Oh, sorry, friend. Just then, we saw a guy pushing his bike. I didn't know him, but he was around our age. And as he passed, I looked down and noticed a familiar glitter by his tire. And looked, I said, another dynamo. But this time, I wasn't afraid. I ran over to the guy and asked if I could see his bike. I bent down and gave the pedal a good spin. And when I did, the headlamp, an old car bulb, car bulb flickered on. Gilbert turned to him. How much to buy the dynamo? He asked. No, Gilbert, I said. I don't have any. How much? Gilbert said again. The guy refused at first, but finally gave in. No one was foolish enough to refuse money at this time. Two hundred kwacha, he said with a bulb. I still have some money from my father, Gilbert told me. Let's use it to buy the dynamo. Let's finish the windmill. Reached into his pocket and pulled out two hundred kwacha, two red paper notes. After some messing around to get the dynamo and bulb off the bike, I was holding them in my hand. The Como Quad Mujibiri, Gilbert, I said. Thank you very much. You're the greatest friend I ever had. While Gilbert went home, I ran back to my room and placed the dynamo with the other materials, adding the last piece of the puzzle. The moment I laid it down, a magnificent gust of wind blew open my door and spun a cyclone into the room. It whipped up the windmill pieces in its arms and revealed the finished machine, its blades spinning wildly through the blur of red dust. Or maybe that was only a dream.